is terrible. He wrote Oz for us. He wrote Wonderland for adults. He wrote Neverland for grown-ups. And why I don't think it's that good. Everywhere is less than the sum of its parts. Neverwhere by Neil Gaiman is a very, very popular book. It's one of his best known, one of his most beloved books, and I like it. I've read it three, I've read it as many times as I have copies, just not on purpose. But yeah, Neverwhere, it's um, I, I've read it several times and it is so liked and I found myself you know, wondering why it doesn't really work for me that well. And because I've read it now so many times, I think with each time that I've read it, I've narrowed it down more why it is that this book is so popular, but why it doesn't really work for me and why I don't think it's that good. I'm going to make an argument for uh, it being objectively less good than some of his other books, but of course, reading is subjective, art is subjective. So if it's your favorite book, nothing I say can really invalidate that. So basically I've come to the conclusion that Neverwhere is less than the sum of its parts because there's a lot of individual things about Neverwhere that are really, really great and are the very things that I love Neil Gaiman for, but well, the way that it all comes together, or doesn't, is what keeps it from being a favorite of mine and what keeps it from being what, in my opinion, would be more objectively uh, one of his better works. So Neil Gaiman's prose is one of the things that I love him best for. That's why he's my favorite writer. Uh, it's not necessarily that the stories he tells are always my favorite stories. They very often are not, but I am always impressed with his writing. I don't think I've ever read a Gaiman book where I wasn't impressed with the writing, with the prose itself. And that remains true in Neverwhere. Neverwhere there's some really excellent bits of writing. I've often praised um, him for the way that he zeroes in on very specific things about characters, situations, people, like people at large, what it is to be an adult, what it is to be a child, all these kinds of things. He really, he pinpoints very specific things about them to where he does not have to tell you paragraphs and paragraphs, pages and pages about this place or this character or this situation. He can get away with, with being very brief, very concise, and just telling you this like one thing about this character and you now have an image in your mind. You know who they are, you know what they are, you know how they look, you've he just nails it. So I do have some examples, like the way that he describes Mr. Vandemar and Mr. Croup. There are four simple ways for the observant to tell Mr. Croup and Mr. Vandemar apart. First, Mr. Vandemar is two and a half heads taller than Mr. Croup. Second, Mr. Croup has eyes of a faded china blue, while Mr. Vandemar's eyes are brown. Third, while Mr. Vandemar fashioned the rings he wears on his right hand out of the skulls of four ravens, Mr. Croup has no obvious jewelry. Fourth, Mr. Croup likes words, while Mr. Vandemar is always hungry. Also, they look nothing at all alike. And then further still about Mr. Vandemar and Mr. Croup, they were the kind of suits that might have been made by a tailor 200 years ago who had had a modern suit described to him but had never actually seen one. The lines were wrong and so were the grace notes. <laughs> now Mr. Vandemar and Mr. Croup are these sort of like sinister antagonist henchmen type figures that appear throughout Neverwhere. Those are just two examples of how they are described. They are described that way in that style throughout the entire book. So you don't need a ton of elaborate specificity. It's in the absurdity of the descriptions and in the inherent sort of irrationality to how they look and also how the narrator is describing them that gives you a sense of their vibe beyond just their clothes. I mean, in essence, those were just descriptions of their physical appearances, and yet I bet you have a sense of their vibe and the the tone and the the impression you should have of them as characters, not just of what they are wearing. The next example isn't as good. Um, it's about the Lady Door. She looked, Richard thought, as if she'd done a midnight raid on the history of fashion section of the Victoria and Albert Museum and was still wearing everything she'd taken. So, I mean, here again, like, the, the brevity is insane. Like, he... A different author would have said, oh, she was wearing this, which was from this era, and this, which was from this era, and this, which looked like it was from this era, and this was shabby, so it looked like it was genuinely actually old, and, and this here looked like it was a little bit newer, but also like it probably had been worn, and none of it matched, and you could just go on and on and on and on. Or you could be Neil Gaiman and say, it looks like she raided the history of fashion section of the museum and is still wearing everything. And bam, you have an image in your mind of what that is, and also the type of person that would look like that. Then my, uh, my example of his description of Jessica is actually a, is a description of Richard, I guess, who's our main character, but in this way he is describing to you who Jessica is as a person. And Jessica saw in Richard an enormous amount of potential, which, properly harnessed by the right woman, would have made him the perfect matrimonial accessory. Which I th just feel tells you so much about Jessica as a person. Like, I personally have an image in my mind immediately of the type of person that Jessica is even though ostensibly that's a description of Richard. Here's another example where like we are sort of describing Jessica 
incidentally. So this example is from Richard um, meeting Jessica for the first time, and he's in a museum in France. He tried to apologize to her in French, which he did not speak, gave up, and began to apologize in English, then tried to apologize in French for having to apologize in English until he noticed that Jessica was about as English as it was possible for any one person to be. Like just this short sentence, I feel like if you've never read Neverwhere, you still have a pretty good Im image in your mind right now of what Richard is like and what Jessica are like. And you've just had like a few sentences. So like I said, I'm ceaselessly amazed by Neil Gaiman's ability to just very concisely convey so much to you um, beyond what he is on the face of it actually telling you. And that is true in Neverwhere. <laughs> Uh, next, his approach to magic and the inexplicable is again, I very much like his approach to that in general and I like his approach to it in Neverwhere. Magic is inherently illogical and I like that Neil Gaiman, unlike many other writers of speculative fiction, he leans into that. He fully embraces the fact that magic, by its very nature, cannot and should not be made sense of. So he leans into making it make even less sense. So rather than coming up with like wordy explanations for how this thing that is to be magical, it has to be impossible, uh, at least as far as our natural our own real world is concerned. So instead of going, jumping through hoops trying to explain this impossible thing and how the rules of this universe make it possible, he instead draws attention to the inherent impossibility of it and is like, yeah, and it's, and it, you know what, it's happening. <laughs> this thing is completely impossible. Let me remind you how ridiculously impossible this is. And you know what else? This thing is currently happening. So for example, when it comes to angels, Richard did not believe in angels. He never had. He was damned if he was going to start now. Still, it was much easier not to believe in something when it was not actually looking directly at you and saying your name. Uh, likewise, when we're talking about a library that is to be found in London below, uh, another character is saying, he's meeting us in the library. Richard was almost proud of the way he didn't say, what library? or point out that you couldn't put a library on a train. Instead, he followed door towards the Earl's empty throne, round the back of it, and through the connecting door behind it, and into the library. Here again, like I, another author might have gone on and on about how this tiny, tiny train, impossibly, it's bigger on the inside, fits an entire library in it. And when you went through this tiny door, then you opened it into this expanse that is way bigger than it should be because this fits an entire library into it, but the train on the outside looks like a normal cell. You could go on and on and on and on about that. And, you, and it would be, you know, possibly immersive and imaginative. But Neil Gaiman simply has his main character say, you know what, I'm not gonna say that that's impossible. <laughs> you know what, I'm, I'm just gonna accept that this impossible thing is about to happen to me. And then all of us in the audience can also imagine the utter impossibility of a library fitting in a train. Now, perhaps I should have started with this in case you've never read Neverwhere, um, but the concept of Neverwhere I also think is very, very cool. So the concept of Neverwhere, if you've never heard of it, never seen it, I say seen it, it was originally a television show and we'll get to that as well. Neverwhere, even though it's called Neverwhere, the actual place in this portal fantasy is not called Neverwhere, it's called London Below. And in essence, Neil Gaiman was like, so there's all these great portal fantasies, right, for kids. There's Oz, there's Wonderland, there's Neverland. And so he wrote Oz for us. He wrote Wonderland for adults. He wrote Neverland for grown-ups. That's what London Below is supposed to do and be. And as a concept, you know, that's, I love it because I, I love those kinds of stories. And there is, he's right, something inherently magical about that kind of a story. That's why we have so many. But London Below is terrible. The fun of those other portal fantasies is that however dangerous and sinister and macabre some aspects of them are, and they put, you know, their protagonists into some alarming situations that realistically you probably wouldn't want to experience. Nevertheless, they are wondrous places that like a theme park would happily recreate for you and that you would kind of like to imagine going there. Like flying to Neverland. I certainly dreamed about that when I was a kid. I was less of a fan of Wonderland, but again, Wonderland is like pretty kooky and crazy and cool and bizarre. And like, you'd want to see all these crazy wonderful things that Lewis Carroll describes and going to Disneyland in a place that makes you feel like you're in Wonderland is something you would desire to do. <laughs> Similarly, The Wizard of Oz, like the Emerald City and Munchkin Land, like these are places that like the Wicked Witch is pretty scary and realistically you would not want to be confronted with the Wicked Witch. But going to Oz sounds fantastical and fun and imagining that you could do that is something you'd like to imagine. The world of London below, in <laughs> Neverwhere, is it's horrifying. It is a place of nightmares. It's not like kind of terrifying, but mostly wondrous. It's mostly terrifying and not not really wondrous. It's just like absurdly terrifying. <laughs> and I don't, I mean, reading Neverwhere isn't, it's not that scary a book, I wouldn't say, but it's just, it's really deeply unpleasant, the idea of 
being in London below. If you visited the London Underground, or really any subway station, it's, it's like, what if that was magical, but was still grimy and dirty and, and filled with rats and filled with, like, smelly people and close confines and strangeness and rudeness and death and danger and no one is very nice and everything is awful and dingy and dirty and awful and scary and nightmarish and the rats are in charge. You have to not only encounter rats, but you have to like obey the rats. Which again, I mean, if he's going for topsy-turvy, sure, obeying the rats is pretty topsy-turvy, but I don't think that's fun to imagine that. Like the, the initial impression of like, oh, how funny, the rats are actually in charge down below. Like I get it, but also like, get me out of here. <laughs> so in these other portal fantasies, like Alice in Wonderland, like Wizard of Oz, like, like, Neverland or Peter Pan with Neverland in it, there is this kind of sense of like, we're gonna have to go home at the end, but like, oh, what a shame that we have to go home. What a shame that we can't live forever in Wonderland, in Oz, in Neverland. Like, that you'd want to be there, that you'd want to go back, that you're sad to leave it. And leaving London below is like, the sooner the better. So, um, mild spoilers, but like, when we're reaching towards, when we're getting near the end of Neverwhere, and we are presented with the possibility of leaving London below forever. Like, I, I don't, I feel like the book wants you to have this feeling of like, oh, what a shame that is. And wouldn't it be nice to stay in London below? But like, no, it would not be nice to stay in London below. I would never, ever want to be in London below again. Like, <laughs> whose dream is this? If Universal Studios or, or Disneyland was going to recreate the London below experience as a, an area of the park or as a theme park attraction, I'd be like, no. No one wants this. <laughs> Next, Richard, the main character. The problem with Richard is that he's not much of a character. In a lot of these portal fantasies, you know, Dorothy or Alice or or even Harry Potter and the, the portal fantasy that is the wizarding world, they are often audience surrogates to take you on this adventure to be your way to get into this wondrous world, this portal fantasy, but they still usually have a want. They still usually have something that they're trying to do or that they're specifically trying to run away from or whatever it is. I mean, uh, like Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz, she is trying to find the wizard so that he could send her home. Like she has a, a stated goal and desire and now she's going on this adventure and it takes her off course but like she's trying to get to the wizard so he can send her home like she has a, a goal and so that like gives drive and purpose to the story richard things happen to richard things happen around richard richard reacts to stuff that's happening near and around him and the lady door who he is with she does have a stated goal and a want but like, it's not one that richard fully understands or would have any real reason to be invested in seeing done because she's kind of nobody to him. So it's almost like um, if instead of following Dorothy, you're following like the scarecrow who's like decided to help Dorothy, but like it's Dorothy's quest. <laughs> so like Richard is like along for like Dor's quest. But so then Dor should be the protagonist, but Dor is already part of London below. So like she can't be our intro to this like portal into this other world. That's Richard, the normal guy who gets swept into this other world. But he doesn't have a stated goal, a stated purpose. I mean, I guess he vaguely is like, I would like to go home, kind of like Dorothy, but like no one is really giving him a, a, an ability or like a, a way to do that. And so he's not like trying to like go see the wizard so he can go home or something. He's just, he's just kind of helping Dor because Dor needs help. So I guess that's what we're doing. Cool. And this works a little bit better on television where one, a, a charismatic actor can Kind of make up for that lack by just kind of like being a dynamic personality. This can make for an, an effective surrogate for a reader if you are, you know, a, a reader can and see themselves as this average person that gets swept away into this world. But because he has no stated goal or purpose, there's just like a lack of tension and stakes. Like there's like, what are we, what are we doing? Like what are we trying to do? What are we trying to prevent? Like there's nothing we are vicariously striving towards alongside Richard. We're just like, we become just as passive as Richard is in this story. And a passive reading experience is not an engaging one, which is why I think the world of London Below and this story, like I don't feel sucked in by it because I'm not swept away on this quest. I'm not engaged in this quest. I don't feel any stakes for this quest. Like I, okay, Richard is in the, an awful magical subway. That does sound yikes. Like I wish him the best. I don't, I, I don't feel any investment in that or enticement to go on or see how this unfolds. So lastly, Neverwhere was actually originally written for television. And 
that I think shows. And I think that is part of why it doesn't work as well. Because when you're writing for television, certain principles about storytelling remain true no matter what the medium is, but there are certain things about storytelling that your, your priorities will shift depending on the medium. And in visual mediums like film, television, or stage, basically almost any medium but books, some part of your priority is having something be visually appealing or visually enticing or visually exciting. And in a book, unless it's a comic book, it's harder to do things that are just purely visually appealing. Um, certainly there are writers that are famous for their sort of lyrical, beautiful prose um, in lush worlds that they describe, Lainey Taylor, which I personally love. I don't like Aaron Morgenstern, but I know that's what people get out of Aaron Morgenstern's books. Action scenes are this way. I often don't like action scenes in books because like it's again like, okay, it's fun to watch an action scene in a movie because you're actually watching two people um, do something that's really impressive to look at. But you know, it's, it's like watching gymnastics in the Olympics. It's seeing them actually perform this feat that's impressive. If I read a book where it says like they're able to do a handstand, I'm like, cool, they're able to do a handstand. Great. <laughs> but like it's, I'm not seeing it. So like it's not that engaging, whereas in a film it would be. So there's a lot of stuff in Neverwhere that feels like it was written for the screen in that way. That like this was written, this scene was written the way that it is because this would make for an interesting visual, a cool action sequence, a cool sc moment on screen. And that certainly should be your priority if you're writing a story for television. But when Neverwhere became a book, that's less effective. Likewise, the story feels very episodic and it was written as a television show. So having Richard just be kind of this like baseline character, it's just like your average dude who's in this strange situation, but we're kind of like episode to episode kind of just seeing different weird parts of London below and different weird stuff is happening. That like works better as a TV show where we don't have to have this like driving narrative like in a book where Richard is just kind of our eyes, our reason for the audience to like be seeing this scene. But we're not seeing a scene in a book. We're like living this scene through Richard. And if Richard is not interesting, then we're not gonna have an interesting time. And um, I, I mean, I, Richard is not the only one lacking in this regard. I did give examples of his descriptions of characters, which I do think are very effective. And if it wasn't for that, this truly would be a snooze fest. Because despite that, I mean, like the other characters, they they are even less characters than Richard is, and he's not much of one. I mean, like who is Dor? She's like both an inciting incident and a plot convenience and plot device wrapped up into one person. She's not a, a person or a character that you really like feel you know or have a reason to root for or like has layers and complexity. Like she comes into Richard's life, is the inciting incident, is the reason that he ends up in London below. And then because she has magical powers, then she's also the, like the way that magical plot conveniences happen. She's the exposition because she can go around explaining London below to Richard. She's just like, she like f is a functional piece of the story more than a character. And Richard, he's an audience surrogate. And the rest of the characters are even less than Richard and Dor. They're literally just in each individual scene or in each individual episode of this television show, this would be the episode in which we meet this weird quirky character, this weird quirky place, this weird quirky thing. And that's kind of what we do in this episode. And then we move on to the next thing, which in a show works a lot better than in a book. Now there are some truly poignant moments and thought provoking moments in the book, which is why I still do give it four stars. Uh, so a, a moment that comes to mind is Richard's ordeal with the friars. That is quite a weighty moment. But the reason that it's weighty has almost nothing to do with the story. The story itself has no meat to it. When this story manages to, when, or when this book manages to get an emotional reaction out of you, it's almost 100% down to Neil Gaiman's ability to employ a turn of phrase that in itself is something that strikes you, that resonates with you, that hits you in some way. It's, it's the sentence itself. It's not this moment in the story doing it to you. The the moment with the the talk the incident with the friars, the ordeal, that's a little bit more of the story doing it for you. But even then it's more this the specific ways in which he phrases things in that scene that hit home. And so that's why the book is good. It's Neil Gaiman's writing, but it's specifically like his prose and him being a wordsmith and him just constantly just serving truths about life in every sentence. But the story itself doesn't do anything, doesn't have anything, doesn't, there's there's nothing to pull and hook and mesmerize and transport film. And so that's why I feel that it is less than the sum of its parts. You have an excellent writer who has some of the best prose around. You have a really cool concept in this, this portal fantasy for adults, a very creative handling of how magic would work in this scenario to make it very creative and bizarre and and witty. And, and it just kind of feels like a collection of things rather than 
a story. So even though I would give high marks for all of these things, again, I gave high marks for the descriptions of characters, but the characters themselves aren't much to write home about. I give high marks for prose, but the writing of the story isn't much to write home about. I give high marks for the way the world is, the world building is done and described and how magic is described, but it's like a horrifying place to be, so like I don't want to be transported there. So it's, it's a very mixed experience in that sense. What it does very well, it does exceedingly well, because it's game and doing it. But it's so flawed and so held back by both the origin of how it was created and just like generally some issues with how it's structured that it will never be a favorite for me for these reasons. But I get why it could be for others. If you do feel transported and excited to be transported to the world of London below, I do not understand you. But like, if that's true for you, I get why you like Neverwhere. If for some reason something about Richard really resonates with you because there's not that much there. But if what is there just really does work for you and you really latch on to Richard, like I get why then this book might work better for you if you really resonate with Richard. But yeah, I, I don't really get why anyone would super love this book. And I know people do. So maybe you can tell me why if you're one of them. So let me know in the comments down below your thoughts and feelings about Neverwhere. If you have read it, if you want to read it, if you've never read it, if I've convinced you never to read it. I hope not because I do think it's a good book and I do think it's in it. it, it it's quality but it's just, I don't think it's nearly as good as it could or should be based on the list of what's in it. And frankly, because the, the TV show is so old, I find myself thinking Neverwhere would make a really good adaptation, which feels weird to say because it's a, it was adapted from a TV show into a book. But now that we have the technology, I think we should readapt it into a TV show, but you know, better. <laughs> so as I say, let me know in the comments down below your thoughts and feelings, whatever you want, let me know. I post videos on Saturdays, other random times as well, but definitely Saturdays. So like and subscribe, join my Patreon if you feel so inclined. And I'll see you when I see you. Bye.